What you're looking at here is 3 Mark's Port Royal benchmark running on my RTX 4090. This is a benchmark that will test the performance of your GPU using ray tracing. Ray tracing, as you all probably know, is quite graphically demanding and is really stressful on the hardware. You can see here that during this benchmark, our RTX 4090 is pushing above 400 watts of power. For a GPU, that's a lot of power, even for the number one gaming graphics card. But what if I told you that Nvidia had pushed this GPU far above what was needed and that the same level of performance could be attained at significantly less power. That makes things a lot more interesting with the upcoming RTX 5090, and now given the push for efficiency we're seeing in this industry, perhaps this may result in similar pricing, or dare I say, cheaper pricing. Let's discuss that in this video. This video is sponsored by SCD Keys. So you just recently built a gaming PC and are looking to get Windows installed and activated. Well, SCD Keys has got you covered. Over on their website, they offer great deals on various software and games. Right now, you can buy a Windows 11 Pro OEM key for just under $25. Simply click on the link in the video description, use promo code DRSK when checking out, and get 25% off, much cheaper than if you were buying directly. Then once you have your key, you're going to want to open your Windows 11 settings menu. On the left search bar, type in activation settings, then you'll want to click on change product key. Enter in your key and you'll have an activated copy of Windows, it's that simple. You can also use this code to purchase a copy of Windows 10 and also Microsoft Office, a program I use on a daily basis. Thanks to SCD Keys for sponsoring this video, check them out in the video description. Alright, so this whole video was based on this article I had seen back in May, which I'll be explaining later in the video. But just recently, some rumors have surfaced that NVIDIA's next-gen Blackwell GeForce cards, so the RTX 50 series, are going to be getting some substantial increases in power. Now, like with all rumors and leaks, this is to be taken with a grain of salt, and this may not even be true. I recall similar rumors were circulating for the RTX 4090. But this does sort of overshadow the main reason why I made this video. But I had been working on this this video for over a week now and there are some benchmarks and tests that I do in this video which explains my reasoning for making it so that's why we're still going to be rolling with it but just a disclaimer before some of you run off to the comments section. Hey what is going on guys Danny here welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. There is a lot that goes into building a gaming graphics card. You of course have the GPU itself but aside from that you also have the GPU's memory, the PCB, power delivery components, connectors, ports and more. We also can't forget about the R&D labor costs, and marketing. Along with that, we also have the GPU's cooler that's responsible for making sure the GPU and those mentioned components are operating with appropriate thermals. Without the GPU's cooler keeping thermals in check, you'd experience some serious problems from overheating, terrible performance due to thermal throttling, and potentially damage. The size and the type of cooler that's needed for a graphics card depends a lot on the GPU's TDP rating. The RTX 4090 has a TDP of 450 watts, which was a substantial jump from the previous generation generation flagship, the RTX 3090, which had a TDP of 350 watts. Now, TDP isn't necessarily indicative of exact power draw. In fact, we have seen partner models that have vBIOSes configured to run the card with a massive 600 watt power limit. But that TDP figure still gives manufacturers a good idea as to how robust the cooling solution needs to be. So when the RTX 4090 was taped out and manufacturers had gotten specifications from Nvidia, along with knowing that it's going to have a 450 watt plus TDP, this gave them quite a bit of a jolt and they built very beefy coolers for their custom models with large heatsinks. I remember the reactions of folks that were getting their hands on these cards and when reviewers were posting unboxing videos, the reactions were just hilarious. We hadn't seen a graphics card as large as many of the 4090 models ever before. The MSI Gaming X Trio model I've been using in my test bench for nearly two years now is huge, but the benefit of using such a large cooler and the heatsink is that thermals are amazing. During that 3D Mark Port Royal run, you guys can see how the GPU core temp was around 60 degrees Celsius along with the memory, and our hotspot temp was just shy of 70 degrees Celsius despite pulling over 400 watts of power. Though the advantage of using such a large heatsink to keep your GPU cool doesn't come without substantial costs. To create such a large cooling solution where you'll have a requirement for materials from a larger heatsink, copper, vapor chambers, larger fans, that's all going to be adding up. 
and substantially increases the cost of the card. And those extra costs aren't absorbed by the manufacturer, they're then passed on to the consumer. Hence, the AIBs have these models that retail for well above MSRP. This tough gaming model from ASUS has regularly retailed for about $200 to $300 above MSRP, if not even more. The most comical aspect of this whole situation is that it was totally unnecessary. Nvidia could have easily set a much lower power baseline for the reference spec, and if they wanted to let AIBs go crazy with premium 3 or 4 slot models with higher power limits, they could have given them the freedom to do so. But when their own Founders Edition card is such a brick, at some point they're going to have to go back to the drawing board and think, how can we scale this back? because you can't keep increasing cooler size and expect people to upgrade or mod their cases. Looking on ahead, it's obvious that this isn't a sustainable strategy. Well, the answer to this problem is actually quite simple. All they have to do is ensure they're hitting the efficiency sweet spot of the manufacturing process and take full advantage of the headroom available from other components like the memory buffer. People in this community are quick to make memes and jokes about how you need a nuclear reactor to power the 4090. Those jokes are a stretch, but I can see where they originated from, and that's totally the manufacturer's fault for pushing the hardware far beyond what was totally necessary. Given the way a lot of big players in the semiconductor industry are pivoting towards efficiency rather than full throttle, I have a feeling Nvidia will be taking a similar approach. A couple of months ago, I saw an article that was posted over on Video Cards' website, who were sourcing a tweet from OC3D, and a reply to that tweet from copite 7 kimi who's been at the forefront of Nvidia leaks these past few years. This article is what prompted me to make this video in the first place. The original tweet stated how OC3D had some leaks from sources stating the RTX 5090 could be using a gargantuan 4-slot Founders Edition cooler, to which Copite replied and said that this was false and that the RTX 5090 has a 2-slot cooler, and Nvidia typically abides well with the 2-slot or 3-slot dimensions, because You'll have some partner models which have a 3-slot bracket, but the shroud will extend past the bracket, classifying it as a 3.5 or even a 4-slot card. But if we look at the 2080 Ti Founders Edition, that was exactly a 2-slot card. The RTX 3090 had a 3-slot bracket, but was a bit thinner, and then the RTX 4090 Founders Edition was ever so slightly thicker than a 3-slot card, but close enough. So if the RTX 5090 is a 2-slot card, this then means that either Nvidia had a huge break through with their Founders Edition cooler, or they're going to be scaling things back and won't be pushing things so hard from the factory. When it comes to the former, Nvidia does a lot when it comes to their in-house cooler, and this dual fan flow-through design they've been using since the 30 series has been quite good. I recall Gamers Nexus did a collab video with one of the engineers who worked on the cooler, and it just showed how much passion, thought, and creativity went into the design. They do have some brilliant people working for them, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see a new revised cooler that performs very well despite despite having a higher TDP rating. However, when it comes to the latter, this is what I think will be the most likely scenario, and I for one would welcome it. There have been just far too many cases where these companies decided to redline the hardware from the factory, where it eventually bit them in the behind, and we do have some prime examples of that in recent memory, such as the 12 VHP WR connector melting on the 4090s. That connector itself isn't the greatest in my opinion, but what contributed to all those melting cases was also due to how much power those 4090s were drawing. Drawing. Now, if you think about it, the RTX 4080, which has a TDP of 320 watts, and the RTX 4070 Ti, which has a 285 watt TDP rating, those cards haven't had any reports of melting connectors, with the exception of some users using some third-party garbage adapters. Another example of this was when motherboard manufacturers were overvolting the crap out of 7800 X3Ds, literally causing them to explode. And then most recently, we have Intel and their set of problems surrounding the 13 and 14th gen CPUs, and I have made many videos about that whole fiasco at this point recently. But what all those situations have in common is that these companies have just pushed way too much power than necessary, and it always comes down to them scaling stuff back, whether it's lowering power, voltages, boost algorithms, etc. And the RTX 5090 will be no exception. If Nvidia decides for next gen that we're going to be backing off with how much we push clock speeds, and also target a TDP that's about 30-40% to 40 less, compared to our previous gen counterparts, then that's totally fine. This way you create a more stable product for your consumers 
And in a way, this also revitalizes that fun in overclocking. If there's headroom there, great, let the consumers or AIBs go crazy with it. I'd much rather prefer them to target that sweet spot on the efficiency curve out of the box. Just forget about chasing high figures on bar charts for your marketing, especially when it comes to a company like Nvidia. You are already the market leader by a huge margin. It doesn't even matter if your product loses in some benchmarks, people will still buy your stuff regardless. So what I wanted to do was circle back to that benchmark of 3D Mark's Port Royal I showed you earlier and recall that I had also showed another instance of it side by side, exact same hardware except this time the 4090 was pulling like 100 watts less if not more while performance was basically identical. This was achieved quite easily by using MSI's afterburner tweaking software to apply an 80% power limit to the GPU as well as adjusting the voltage frequency curve where I was targeting 2625 megahertz at 900 millivolts which is considerably lower than the stock curve. Furthermore, pushing the VRAM actually doesn't require any extra power, so maximizing the memory buffer from the get-go would be ideal and helps maintain performance close to stock. With these changes, it's actually quite astonishing to see how the same stock performance was attained while we cut power by like 100 watts. This also translates well to real-world scenarios. Next, we'll take a look at Black Myth Wukong, and this is a new title that's been making the rounds and for good reasons. It's an excellent action game with really fun combat, fun bosses, and gorgeous visuals. If you're a fan of Souls games or just action games in general, I highly recommend trying it out. Now, when it comes to visuals, this doesn't come without a cost, and what you're looking at here is the game running on my 4090 at 4K with high settings and path tracing. I didn't use any upscaling or frame generation, as I wanted to be GPU bound as possible, so just ignore the bad performance as what we're focused on is power consumption. You can see on the left-hand side with stock settings, the 4090 is running at around 430 watts of power. However, on on the right where we tweaked it, we're easily seeing a difference of around 100 watts, but for the same performance. Again, highlighting that this level of performance could have easily been achieved without redlining the hardware. Alan Wake 2 is another high fidelity game that's quite demanding for the hardware. We're running at 4K, high settings, and path tracing enabled, and you can see on the left hand side using the stock 4090, it's again pushing around 420 to 440 watts of power, whereas on the right hand side with the power tweaks, we're easily seeing around 100 watts less. Again, for the exact same performance. What also helps is that temps are overall lower and that therefore leads to less noise as the fans aren't spinning as fast. The next game we're going to take a look at here is The Last of Us Part 1 and this game doesn't have path tracing or ray tracing but it has its own method of emulating realistic lighting and I think it looks quite good and at 4K with high settings the performance isn't terrible. The 4090 when running stock isn't actually pushing as much power as what we saw in Wukong or Alan Wake 2 but it's still getting close to around 400 watts which is you know still pretty high. But once again on the right hand side we're able to maintain that same performance while we scale back power considerably. Now 300 watts of GPU power is still relatively high but when you have a card offering this much performance I'd say it's justified but any more beyond that to chase an extra couple of FPS is well insanity and something I wish Nvidia had paid more attention to when rolling out these cards. Another example of where this works is with Cyberpunk 2077. Again, we're running at 4K high settings with path tracing, no DLSS or frame gen, so we're completely hammering the GPU. What's interesting about this game is that we're not seeing the same drastic power saving effects we saw with other titles. I mean, sure, there is a difference, but it's not as profound as with other titles. This just goes to show you how stressful this game can be on your GPU. Even with an 80% power limit and a decrease in the voltage frequency curve, this game is just really that demanding. Doing these kinds of tests really puts a spotlight on how much these components are being pushed and their out-of-the-box states aren't really optimal. What's sad too is that overclocking at best may grant you another what 10% in some specific scenarios but you're really going to be throwing efficiency out the window if it wasn't already obscene in the first place. This doesn't just apply to high-end GPUs as well but when I had reviewed the RTX 3060 Ti a few years back I had made a follow-up content piece showing how you can drastically reduce power usage on that mid-range card where power usage or consumption may be even more important to the target audience, and the performance loss was negligible. I'm trying to rationalize why they might be doing this in my head, and maybe it's because gone are the days where we would have massive node shrinks every generation that would facilitate large efficiency improvements, along with bringing a massive performance improvement as well. So now they're just trying to max out the fabrication node as much as they can so that those minimal performance improvements we're getting over the previous gen look somewhat enticing, but at the cost of massive power draw. 
This is why when I saw those rumors about Nvidia possibly using a two-slot cooler, I thought, hey, perhaps they're going to be taking on a different approach and actually tune the hardware properly from the factory and just hit that sweet spot on the efficiency curve rather than push the power envelope and chase benchmarks for marketing. The other huge advantage of being able to optimize hardware for efficiency and using a smaller cooler th is that overall costs do come down. Lowering costs could potentially lead to a lower price since you then don't need such a large heatsink. They don't need to bolster up the PCB with an abundance of high limit power delivery components. By taking on this approach for their next gen gaming graphics cards, who knows there might not be any price increases as many are fearing or there may even be some price drops in those segments. Now whether Nvidia will pass those savings on to the consumer is a totally different story, and given the way they like to behave in the market in this industry, I highly doubt it. Especially since there have been so many leaks and rumors suggesting AMD isn't going to be competing in the high end or in the enthusiast market. Which then does also make you wonder why they're even pursuing to extract so much from the silicon in the first place. With the RTX 50 series, Nvidia isn't going to be using a newer manufacturing process, even if their marketing states it's a new advanced node, it's really just an enhanced version of TSMC's 4N. So a process that's two years old makes it a lot more mature, and that can help in reducing wafer costs. Along with that, in late 2022, we were still dealing with a lot of the negative effects from the pandemic, strain on shortages for raw material, which at this point have been mostly a result. And while Nvidia is getting comfortable on the AI gravy train, they have to realize for the general consumer market, which is still a decent chunk of their business, it needs to remain stable in this economy where there is a looming recession and consumer spending is just a lot more cautious. Nvidia might be incentivized to keep prices stable or even lower them to maintain demand. But now we're starting to get into the whole economics portion of the subject, which is a topic for a different video. As what I wanted to mainly highlight to you guys was that manufacturers like in Nvidia, Intel, and even AMD, they don't need to be pushing their hardware this much. It just doesn't make sense anymore for the regular consumer. But that's going to be wrapping it up for this one. Let me know your thoughts below. We'll be touching base in the next video. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing. I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care, and I'll see you in the next one.